All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the panel. Uh, this is Climate Vulnerability and Adaptation, Training with the Tribal Climate Health Project. Uh, this is the title slide for my presentation, so that's why it only has my name on it, but uh, it's not just me. Uh, I'm Shasta Gallen. I am the Environmental Director and the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Paula Band of Mission Indians. And I am joined today by Levi Anderson. Levi, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, Shasta said, I'm Levi Anderson. I'm the environmental manager for the 29 Palms Band of Mission Indians in Southern California. Good to be here. Thanks, Levi. And uh, we also have Suzanne from EPA, who is both participating and facilitating. So Suzanne, you want to intro? Sure. I'm Suzanne. I work at US EPA Region 9 in Water Division and manage some um, grants with some of the tribes. And I also work on climate adaptation and I'm glad to help tribes out with that. Thank you. Great, okay. Well, I'm just gonna jump right in. Uh, so the way this is structured today is that I'm gonna be giving a, an initial presentation on the work that I do for the Tribal Climate Health Project. And then we're gonna follow up with Levi who has been one of our participants in the Tribal Climate Health Project's trainings. And he's gonna provide some feedback on what he's learned from the project and how 29 Palms has been able to uh, apply it to their climate planning. And then Suzanne's gonna follow up with some resources and, and granting uh, funding opportunities for tribes. So, uh, Again, as I mentioned, I'm Shasta Gon from uh, Paula as their environmental director in TIPO. And a, a couple of years ago, or actually like four years ago now, Paula was fortunate to be awarded funding from the EPA to develop a tribal climate change adaptation training project. And we named it the Tribal Climate Health Project. It was a five-year grant. It was uh, nice and, and significant. And we were really, really excited to get started in the first year of that project. And that was in 2016. We started it in October. And of course, in November of 2016, there was a rather shocking change in the trajectory of the nation's leadership with the election of Donald Trump. So. Unfortunately, what that meant for our project was that even though the grant itself was never pulled, after the first year, it was no longer funded. So we had to find additional funding sources elsewhere. And fortunately, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs Tribal Resilience Program, through the National Indian Health Board, through some California state funding, we were able to continue the project. So. I wanna to talk to you today about what we were able to accomplish and what we are continuing to do with the Tribal Climate Health Project. So just a little bit of the structure of the projects. The, the point of the Tribal Climate Health Project is to provide a national level training program for climate and health adaptation. And the health piece of it was something that was a little bit different. There's plenty of tribal, plenty of uh, climate, I should say, adaptation training uh, and resources available. One of the things we did was to bring in the health aspect of the adaptation and vulnerability assessment process. And so we partnered with Prosper Sustainably, which is a consulting group and developed an advisory group of technical advisors from all over the country, from different tribes and from different organizations to help us develop this curriculum. Uh, and a lot of that, uh, like I said, was through the Climate Ready Tribes Project, which is part of the National Indian Health Board, who in turn get their funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So we developed our own adaptation and vulnerability assessments and then used those as a pilot to develop these intertribal sharing products so that we could take what we had learned and provide it to others to be able to help them with their own assessments. So I, I mentioned health, and one of the things that we are focused on in the Tribal Climate Health Project is a different way of looking at health. What we want 
people to include in their vulnerability assessments and adaptation plans is health as an impact from climate change. So we have these multiple exposures that we identified and not every tribal community is going to be uh, affected by every single one of these exposures, but writ large, we developed these five different major exposures of, of temperature extremes, wildfire, storms and flooding, drought, and then melting ice and sea level rise. And from those, we can identify not only the impacts on the environment, plant communities, animals, uh, tribal traditions, that sort of thing. We also identified what the both physical and physiological health impacts are, and then also some of the psychosocial impacts of climate change. So things like impacts to mental health. So we all know worsened air quality, uh, changes in insect communities, especially those that carry disease, uh, water insecurity, whether that's a lack of water or water that's not clean, food insecurity, these are all impacts that are seen in the natural built and health and social environments in communities. And again, from the health perspective, we wanted to make sure that that included what that meant for individual health and also for tribal community health. So we ask ourselves, you know, what is health? And we have this finding from the fourth national climate assessment uh, that I won't read to you, you can read for yourself, but it includes definitions of health from an indigenous perspective and acknowledges that health is not always what we think it is. What my definition of health is may not be the same as what constitutes health in somebody else's community or based on somebody else's identity and values. So we are trying to define or not trying, we are defining health more broadly than the absence of medical disease. Health for us is also a thriving community. Health is the ability to adapt to change. Health is resilience. Health is connectedness. So a lot of our tools in the Tribal Climate Health Project and in our training focused on making sure that those particular elements of, of health were included as part of the, the broader adaptation planning. So again, we have human health. We also have spiritual and cultural health. And, and that transcends you know, boundaries. And you know, what is spiritual and cultural is obviously going to be specific to communities. But broadly speaking, stresses that come about on the environment from climate change are also going to create stresses on spiritual and cultural health. Socioeconomic health, of course, and that's why we'll have Suzanne coming in at the end to talk about funding opportunities, because these are things that cost money and, and they can also create uh, job loss and uh, you know a lack of, of resources. So there's really a big impact on socioeconomic health, which goes back towards some of our other health impacts on mental health. And then ultimately our mental health can impact our physical health. So one of the things we focused on was trying to do some of the background work first for people. So that way, when you're doing your own assessments, you're not having to start from the baseline and do the research to determine what the potential health impacts are uh, from, from climate change. So we have these various identified drivers and then the exposures and then the health outcomes. Uh, and I will show you where you can find this uh, later and you'll also get a copy of the, of the uh, PowerPoint to look over if you'd like. But we're showing that these drivers, you know, these, these uh, impacts, which are the extreme heat, air quality, et cetera, what is, how is that being changed by the climate changes we're experiencing? Uh, and then what exposures does that expose us to? And what are the health impacts of that and, and the ultimate impact? So let's just pick one, Lyme disease as an example. So we have changes in temperatures and seasonal weather. We have geographic expansion of where ticks can thrive. And where the ticks move in, the Lyme disease will move in or could move in. So what do we see here? Ticks with an earlier seasonal activity, a, a northward range expansion, an increased risk of human exposure to Lyme disease. So areas that may not have had to consider Lyme disease in the past 
may have to be considering those things now. And so these are some of the exposures we've already linked to health and made available so that people can check this out and see where that might have an impact on their particular community. So I know we're here in region nine, we've got a couple of examples of uh, how climate change is affecting tribes in region nine, but we all know that obviously climate change is gonna affect health and well-being differently in different places. On this slide, our region nine example is for the Navajo or the Diné. There's a heat and water insecurity. And of course, we also now know because of the pandemic that tribes are more likely to be more adversely affected by COVID-19 outbreaks. And that's uh, certainly true for the Navajo Nation who has had uh, a really tragic and large outbreak uh, and incidents of COVID-19 and associated mortality. Um, we've got other issues in terms of changes to river flows, changes to rainfall patterns, uh, looking at the Great Lakes for an example, you know, decreased water levels means the disappearance of subsistence species. So not just fish or animals, but also wild rice, which is something that has a really dramatic effect on you know, the spiritual and cultural health of Great Lakes communities that if you can't harvest the wild rice, that has an impact on you know, your, your spiritual and cultural health because not being able to gather the rice is a, a big impact. California, we have an example of acorns, not being able to gather acorns or changes in acorn harvesting or acorn, um, the ripening of the acorns, different patterns for that. All of these are really important impacts from climate change and they're, they're cultural impacts, not just environmental impacts. And if they're cultural impacts, that means they're also psychosocial health impacts. So based on this, we developed some learning objectives for our training and you know our expectation, and this comes straight from our, our grant proposals and our work plans, we want to help tribal folks who are working on adaptation and vulnerability assessments to understand basic climate science. Now, I'm sure that most people at this point have a grasp and have heard a lot about what is driving climate change, but you may have new folks who are coming into your departments. You may have changes in tribal leadership, and I know some people are grappling with a little bit of climate denial among some of their tribal leadership or, or even their tribal members. So our training is supposed to help you become better informed, but you can also take what you've learned and develop your own learning opportunities for your leadership or your new staff or for your community. And as we've just been talking about, there's this important link between human health and climate change. That's something else you need to be able to communicate to your leaders, to your community members. And what we have found is that in many instances, people aren't making that link between human health and, and climate change right away. But it's a really powerful tool that we can use to show people that climate change actually does have an impact and a direct impact on individuals as well as communities. So it's one thing to say to people, you know, there's, there's sea level rise and there's melting ice. Well, if you're in the desert Southwest, you're like, yeah, okay, sea level rise. Why should I care about sea level rise? Or why should I even really care about drought and high temperatures? It's always been hot and it's always been dry. Well, if you can make that link and say, okay, but these changes are getting worse. And what we're finding is that it's increasing the amount of ozone in the air which has a direct impact on exacerbating cardiopulmonary health. So asthma problems, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, two things that are prevalent in tribal communities. So if you can say to people, look, your health today, your actual health today, or the health of one of your loved ones, or the health of one of your tribal citizens, if you're a tribal leader, is directly impacted today by climate change. So we provide those 
those tidbits for you to use um, when you take our training. You want to have that knowledge, that working knowledge of climate change, health impacts, and, and strategies. So again, the training has a, a lot of material on what the health impacts are, and you can pick and choose amongst those for the ones that are most relevant to your community. And then we have strategies, just some, some basic strategies that you can expand upon to help your community address those. And then finally, you want to end up with the appropriate knowledge and skills and, and tools needed to develop your own climate change vulnerability assessment, your own climate change adaptation plan. Uh, and that's something that Levi will be talking to us about and his experience after the training uh, to show us how it worked for him. Uh, so again, you end up with your climate change adaptation plan um, and then you want to be able to implement that plan. So that's actually kind of coming up in our next round of training is the implementation process. So, and then where do you go for additional tools, et cetera? So we provide a lot of that in our training materials. So just briefly, um, this is an example slide from one of our, our training webinars that helps to develop the process of where do you go first? First, you want your vulnerability assessment and then based on your vulnerabilities, you create your adaptation plan. Uh, but how do these things overlap? You know, you, you've got to start from the beginning. And I know for a lot of people uh, who have never had to do anything like this before, that it can be very, it can feel very overwhelming. And so we try to start from, from first steps. And what I tell people is that it's a little bit like training for a marathon. I don't know how many of you run a marathon. If you have, why don't you put that in the chat and we can all agree that running marathons is really hard. I did one. Notice I just said one, one was enough. <laughs> and when I decided to train for that marathon, I didn't just wake up one day and say, you know, I wanna do a marathon. Oops, did I push forward? I didn't mean to. I wanna do a marathon, so I'm gonna go run 14 miles today. Heck no. I said, I wanna do a marathon, let's see. When am I gonna do this marathon? I'm gonna do it next year. And today I'm gonna to go and just walk a mile and I'll run some of it and I'll see how I feel. And it took me that full year to get to that point. So I guess it's that whole cliche, journey of a thousand steps, you gotta take that first step. But don't be afraid. It's not like you have to start and already know everything, you train. And, and it's no different with developing your vulnerability assessment and your adaptation plan. So, like I said, you identify your vulnerabilities and then you can identify strategies. And we have this cycle of the um, adopting, implementing, evaluating, and updating. And you do that with both your vulnerability assessment and your adaptation plan. And we provide tools for helping people do that as well. And I think the update is really important. You know, things change. So something that wasn't as big of a vulnerability in your initial vulnerability assessment, say five years from now, you're reviewing your plan and you realize something that was not a big deal then has actually become a bigger deal now. You know, for example, maybe we've had dengue fever that we didn't have five years ago that has now moved into our community or close to our community. So we need to update uh, our plan. So I'm talking about all this stuff and I keep saying training and resources. So I want to show you some of these capacity building resources that we have developed as part of the Tribal Climate Health Project. So this is a screenshot of the Tribal Climate Health Project website. And I may go to the actual website when I'm through some of these slides to show you a few things, uh, but it's easy to find tribalclimatehealth.org. And as you can see at the top here, we have you know, different drop-down menus. Now, I wanna show you a couple of specific areas of the website in the slides. One thing that we're really proud of is our resources clearinghouse. So if you go under our learn tab and there's a drop-down menu and one of them is this resources clearinghouse. So again, this is just a slide, so I'm not gonna be able to show you interactively how this works. But within this resource, we have other climate adaptation plans from tribes who have made theirs public. We have vulnerability assessments. We have 
journal articles. We have things like the fourth climate assessment, the third, all the climate, the national climate assessments. We have state level assessments. We have all sorts of resources and materials. And you can just go into the search right here and you can search for something broad. So you can put in adaptation plan. It'll bring up all adaptation plans that are in our, our database. But if you click on the pluses here, you can actually be very specific about it. So if you want, oops, if you want an adaptation plan that is just for the Pacific Northwest, you can click here and you get uh, menus of geographic regions so that you can, if, you're, if it's not useful for you to have something from the Great Plains because you're in you know, the, the Pacific Coast, you're not gonna uh, be shown resources that might not be relevant to you. So I would suggest uh, you could go to this resource and just start playing with it and find, uh, find some resources. And we are updating that clearinghouse all the time. If you have materials that you'd like to allow us to put on that resource uh, clearinghouse, please email them to me and I would be really excited to add them to our, to our database. Also under learning, we have a variety of tools here and I'm gonna you know, give a, a brief overview of each one. Uh, at the top, we have our exposures, impacts and strategies inventory tool. And we call that the easy tool, E-I-S-I. And it's, I mean, technically we still call it a beta version, but it's basically a spreadsheet. So here we go, folks who like Excel, uh, and this was all put together by Angie Hacker, who is uh, one of the consultants with Prosper Sustainably. She did an amazing job on this incredibly detailed spreadsheet. And this is again, the easy tool, and you can download your own blank version of this from the tribalclimatehealth.org website and fill in your own exposures. So simple enough, this is under the evaluate strategies tab, but you start at the beginning with evaluate exposures. And this is, I believe this is filled out for Paula. So you check off the things that are relevant to your particular area. And then it gives you a menu of some different adaptation strategy options. And then within these different parameters, is it a policy strategy? Is it an infrastructure improvement? And then you can track your status. So if you have an adaptation plan that says, okay, we do want to install backup power generators because we're in a public service power shutoff or a public safety power shutoff area because of critical wildfire danger, you are going to adapt to that by you know, getting some backup power through your generators. So that's an infrastructure improvement. And then you can rank where, how big of a need is that? High, medium, or low? Um, you know, what does the community think? What, are your, what does your leadership think? Um, and then what are your details here? Who's gonna do that? Is it gonna be your tribal services, your tribal utilities department? Um, who else is involved? Who are your partners? What's it gonna cost? Um, and then is it complete? It's always nice to get to this one and say 100%. So again, this is just one tab. Um, it can seem a little overwhelming if you're like me and you think Excel is scary, but it's really a super useful tool to just play with and start filling out for yourself. And like I said, we have a blank version of it online. For developing your initial uh, priorities for your community, we've made available a survey template that's in Google Forms. So if you have a Google account, you can go to the link and uh, the form will pop up and you can just borrow that and modify it for your own uses. Or if you don't want to use the Google Forms version, you can still use it to as a template to develop your own paper survey or if you do it in SurveyMonkey, whatever your particular outreach strategy happens to be. But there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. We've got the basics on there and you can customize that for your own use. See, and I think I gave a, yeah. So here's a, a, a few of our, our questions uh, that we put into the, the survey. So, you know, what are the exposures and what, what's your priority, for example? You know, do you care about the physical wellness of, of residents? You know, most people are gonna say, yeah, that's a high priority. Um, nutritional abundance, you may not be having issues with nutrition. So you're gonna say, yeah, that's not a big deal to me. Get this from several community members, from tribal leaders, et cetera even from staff people who work in this area, you're gonna get a lot of good data. 
we have sample reports. So with the permission of our leadership, we shared our vulnerability assessment and climate change adaptation plan. So there's PDF versions, but there's also Word versions. So seriously, we have no problem whatsoever with you taking our version. And I mean, this is a joke, but do a search and replace and, you know, search Paula Band of Mission Indians and replace it with your tribe. <laughs> and then turn that into your project officer. Ha, just, just kidding, Jeremy, if you're listening, CJ. <laughs> uh, but we made it in Word because there's things in there that you might just want to be able to copy and paste directly into your own, you know, some of the introductory stuff. So like I, you know, it's a cliche, but don't reinvent the wheel. Why would you rebuild something from scratch when there's something you can use that's already a template for you? So and these are just the covers of our uh, vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan. Uh, and then we have fact sheets. So this is part of our implementation. We wanted to have some just really quick and easy ways to get some of this information out to our tribal members. And we recommend the same thing to our trainees. So here's a couple examples of the front page of some of our climate change preparedness handouts for the community. Uh, these are both in, um, they're printed out and they're also uh, available on our website. And we have these on the Tribal Climate Health Dot org website as well. So uh, feel free to download these and, and modify those for your own use as well. And then finally, but not really finally, um, so we've had now two national webinar series and we have put the slides and the, the videos from those online. So you can go to this, here's the URL, but it's still, it's under learn. We have this self-paced training where you can watch each webinar on your own time. And there's links to the training materials that are associated with those webinars. So the ones that are currently online came from our 2019 training. We also now have uh, online, I believe it's on, it's on this website. It's also on the Paula Environmental Department website. We have our more recent, but it's the same material. We had another one that went from January to August of, of 2020. So you can watch those on your own and learn from those materials. So what are our takeaways? So we talked about both physical and psychosocial uh, mental well-being. So that's what we want people to have. It's not the only focus, but it's a key focus in your climate uh, adaptation planning. There are ways to connect with health professionals, both within and outside of your community. Uh, and then we have this growing learning community. And in fact, if you want to become a part of our, our website um, listserv, we can add you to that listserv, which I'd like to get to be more active so that we can share these opportunities with one another. And then here's a couple of websites where you can find uh, some of our resources. And let's see, looking at my watch with that. Uh, I was going to show you the website, but I think you guys can find it for yourself. Uh, and I want to pass it over to Levi. Thank you, Shasta. Hello, everybody. My name is Levi Anderson. I am the environmental manager for the 29 Palms Band of Mission Indians in Southern California. And I just was going to talk about some of my own experiences with uh, participating in this series and uh, how we applied it to, how the tribe applied it to their own adaptation plans and uh, potential uh, future plans for that as well. So am I the, do I need to share screen or how do I get my presentation up? <laughs> I think you need to share your screen. Okay, there you go. Take your time. There we go. All right. Okie dokie, all right. Hey, just a little background. As I mentioned earlier, I'm the environmental manager for the 29 Palms Band. Uh, the tribe is of Chimwavy Chim ancestry with reservation land in two Southern California counties. Um, I input this picture here, I always like it. You could see there's a desert tortoise in the bottom right corner of the photo that was captured on the uh, uh, reservation near 29 Palms. And I just thought it was a relevant photo uh, considering all the climate change impacts that are occurring. And it's 
I know it's only anecdotal, but for the te desert tortoise, you know, when we've noticed, when we've uh, encountered them on the reservation, we've noticed that they prefer a little bit of that uh, higher altitude or higher elevation, considering the uh, increased temperatures, it's having an effect on the, on the around and that vegetation is a little more abundant in higher altitudes. That's just anecdotal, anecdotal, but it's just interesting. So this will give you a perspective of where the tribe's reservation lands are. As I said earlier, the 29 Palms uh, section is just south of the city of 29 Palms. And the Riverside County reservation section is in the Coachella Valley. They're about 30 miles, uh, separated by about 30 miles. Just a little background on the tribe's climate change uh, planning initiatives. Began in 2017 with the development of a tribal climate change vulnerability assessment. Uh, the vulnerability assessment was developed to focus on key sectors such as natural and man-made and identifies the greatest risk to them from climate impacts. After the assessment was finalized, the tribe, oops, the tribe um, embarked on the journey to develop a climate change adaptation plan. Adaptation plan offers strategies that address many of the key areas of vulnerability highlighted in the vulnerability assessment. The latest project the environmental and cultural resource departments of the tribe are working on is the development of a cultural resources climate change plan. Both departments are working in coordination, inventorying tribal cultural resources and analyzing their vulnerability to climate impacts. The resulting work would be incorporated into an adaptation plan that will inform management measures for cultural resources in the context of climate change. When developing these climate change planning documents, I encountered numerous challenges. Um, when it was first presented to me as a uh, project, I was a little at loss of where to start. I typed in Google how to develop vulnerability assessments. This was prior <laughs> to any of these uh, valuable um, this training series or anything I've learned since then, but it was just, uh, it was, uh, a little, a little um, intimidating at first, but some of the other challenges I found were re related to finding appropriate resources. I find that there are abundance of resources related to climate change data and overall big picture impacts, and I think that's great to have. It's always great to have that abundance of those resources and data. However. Um, it can be difficult sorting out what is best applied to your tribe situation or wherever you are. Um, however, one of the, in, in that, in those resources, I found that there is very little from tribal indigenous perspectives in the unique climate change impacts uh, tribes face. Also of the planning resources I found, most are primarily focused on infrastructural and environmental elements are geared towards local governments and municipalities. And finally, many of the resources I found only covered human health impacts in a very broad sense. For example, you know, higher temperatures will lead to more hospitalizations. However, they didn't cover other implications that these impacts have on mental, behavioral, and cognitive well-being. So participating in the Tribal Climate Health and Adaptation Series not only helped help me overcome some of these challenges I mentioned earlier, but I learned a lot and many things I never considered in developing climate change plans. Uh, when I first started participating in the series, we were already at a point, the tribe was where we'd completed the vulnerability assessment and about pretty close to finishing the adaptation plan. However, um, there were still, Plenty of elements that incorporate, uh, plenty of elements from this series that I incorporated into uh, the adaptation plan that were helpful. Um, the training provided me with a base understanding of what climate change means and the scientific background behind drivers, such as greenhouse gas emissions and the greenhouse effect 
resulting changes. I know Shasta had mentioned earlier that a lot of these are, I mean, just very commonly known. However, it, it helps to reinforce those, those basic fundamentals and be able to relate it to the tribe in a way that makes sense. Uh, I learned in greater detail about various exposures as a result of climate changes, such as temperature extremes, food security, vector changes, et cetera, and the impacts these exposures have not only on the natural and built environment, but extra emphasis placed on human health and cultural spiritual health and impacts to tribal traditional activities. Well, losses of culturally important plant or animal species can inhibit a tribe's ability to perform ceremonial or traditional activities, which can in turn lead to community and mental health risks. One webinar session in particular stands out to me, which was a session on psychosocial resilience in the context of stressors related to climate change occurring in tribal communities. The session identified numerous strategies to support mental wellness in the community through promoting positive activities that reduce stresses and increase social interaction. In a, in a way, it was like a session on adapting your mind to our unfortunate reality, but it's also um, valuable to be uh, honest about what's going on and honest with each other. So I thought that was a great session. A lot of time was spent on the vulnerability assessment and adaptation planning process. I learned the significance of these two planning documents and how they're interrelated in the multi-step process in creating them, which includes determining goals and objectives that are specific to the tribe. With each step in the planning process, I learned about the specific tools and resources available to help complete each step, some of which were data sources, report templates, and exposure impact tools. Before this webinar series, I was just, like I said, men mentioned earlier, I was just intimidated by the sheer amount of resources available and didn't know where to start and how to pick the right tool for the, for the job. However, trainings did a fantastic job of breaking down the resources in, easy, in an easy to understand way and explaining each significance. Also networking with tribes, uh, being able to communicate and network with tribes and their environmental staff in these webinars was also valuable. It was helpful being able to share stories and experiences in these climate change planning endeavors and communicating elements that have worked and some that haven't. Also listening and learning about climate change impacts and the challenges other tribes are facing was um, very, it was a very positive experience. It's. Uh, some of these things you learn are incredibly disheartening, but you know it's it's we need to be talking about it and and sharing what uh, what what strategies and adaptation plans work. And a large takeaway from the series is that there is no one right way to to develop and execute these plans. Um, what I mentioned earlier that we were at a point where we had the vulnerability assessment completed and about halfway through the adaptation plan. And I just started thinking, I shouldn't have done this or I shouldn't have done that or I could have done this better. And I'm just starting to mark up everything in the document. I just like, tear it all down, but that, that doesn't have to be the case. It, it's, it's specific to the tribe and it, it doesn't need to follow a linear path. Applying some of the lessons learned. So I understood that vulnerability assessment and adaptation plans didn't contain enough information related to mental, spiritual, and cultural health. Um, focused primarily uh, when we first started developing the vulnerability assessments on, on the resources that I found most accessible related to, you know, your structural uh, infrastructure resources, your planning uh, resources and whatnot. Um, and I understood that there is not enough in our current planning documents that address uh, mental, spiritual, and cultural health. And with that, I understood the importance of, I need to make a better effort at being the tribe with a, a lot of these uh, surveys and questions. And i had done it previously, however, it could be done to a, a greater extent, it has to be ongoing. After 
these plans are developed, uh, you need to continuously assess where you are in your planning goals and revise where necessary. Um, with this information, I developed a section in the climate change adaptation, adaptation plan to monitor and evaluate progress on achieving goals and um, just strategies to implement that will help you uh, keep track of those, your progress. After the training series, I evaluated the training and concluded um, that I need to reach out more consistent, consistently, like I mentioned earlier, on the planning documents and also uh, stress the linkages of climate change with all aspects of the tribal government, enterprises, development, et cetera. Um, I've noticed if you present this as strictly, you just walk into it with only a, through, well, you're just thinking climate change, you have to be able to communicate the impacts to everything in front of you and, and how, uh, and what the consequences of that can be. Um, also, I learned, don't be afraid to reach out to others. Uh, that's, I know I, I stress that and I don't always do a good job at that as far as uh, uh, support in developing these plans and reaching out for resources and uh, data sources and whatnot, or just uh, sending an email to another uh, colleague and asking about, hey, what, what worked in this situation? Do you have any um, advice or what can be done? Uh, you don't have to operate in a vacuum. Um, and also that goes within you, the tribe itself. Uh, these plans aren't meant to be executed by one person and one person alone. You have to have uh, a team put together as far as everyone knowing where uh, their duties or wherever their roles are and how they fall within the uh, climate change planning. So I included this, uh, it's a uh, matrix from our climate change adaptation plan, just a component of the matrix, uh, just an example of how the plan is organized. So it's the matrix is divided into sectors, elements, and associated climate change impacts to those areas. And we then have strategic goals for managing these impacts and potential adaptation actions. Uh, for future revisions of the plan, I'd like to include the progress section, like Shasta had shown on the uh, website, in order to track what has been achieved in areas of improvement. But this just gives you a, a basic example of how we organize the document and uh, how we have it set up. And that concludes my presentation. So thank you everyone. And I also wanted to say thank you to Shasta and Angie Hacker with Prosper Sustainability and all the participants in the webinar series. It was uh, great sharing that time with you and hope for more in the future. Thank you, Levi. It's, this is the first time I've seen somebody go through you know, their process and how it helped. And I, I, I feel like a proud parent. So <laughs> that, that's, that's awesome, thank you. Um, and uh, now Suzanne is going to share a few resources for us. And I, I just put her document that she's screen sharing into the chat that has uh, live links in it. So Suzanne, take it away. Okay, can you guys hear me? Maybe up a little bit. All right, let's try that. Is that That's better? better? Yeah. All right. Um, so just real quick, my part's going to be quick because we definitely wanted you all to hear mostly from other tribes because that's most important. But um, just real briefly, this is a list of some of the EPA grants that we use in Region 9 that um, you, know, you can use to build resilience. Of course, the GAP grants are the main thing where you can fund um, climate adaptation plans and climate assessments. And just so you know, I also put in the chat earlier, um, Heads up that there are at least three staff here in Region 9. We work with the GAP office, um, Ray Saraceno, Dana Mayfield, and myself to provide assistance in reviewing work plans that have cli the climate aspects and, and GAP work plans. 
And we also are available to help look at some of your adaptation plans and vulnerability assessments. Of course, there are many experts that you can see from the presentations today and many examples where you can go to get information as well. But we're glad to help facilitate if needed. Um, and also I wanna say a lot of folks will access EPA gap money and then um, like 29 Palms access um, BIA resilience grant funding and the BIA resilience grant folks know us. And so we're glad to work together and provide information as needed. So that's the main information I wanted to get across. And now we can do Q and A for everything and I'll stop sharing my screen. Let us Thank know you, if you Suzanne. have questions. We are really open to answering questions. Well, and like I said, the uh, the document is in the in the chat, but I do see we have one question from John Flores. He wants to know how has the community reacted to the findings of your climate change adaptation plan? And Levi, you want to answer that for 29 Palms? Sure. Um, initially, it was confusing <laughs> to be able to communicate all of these uh, sectors and all of these areas what are potentially impacted by climate change. And it's like, okay, we have this information, so what do we do? And that's where in the adaptation plan, you know, we have practical strategies uh, for addressing each of those, you know, risks or exposures, impacts. And when it was broken down in a way that was, again, I can't stress, it has to be very simple and easy to understand with how it connects to uh, you know, what the tribes is doing as far as, you know, development or um, all, all spheres of the tribal government. And once they see it broken down in a way that's easy to understand and, and comprehend how it affects everything, they were, they were excited and very uh, eager to, you know, implement the plan in, in, in a way that we could track our progress and kind of assess where we're going. So, I just have to uh, make sure on my, on my own part to continually update and, and uh, track where we're going and make those necessary revisions. So uh, one thing I always focused on was uh, when I was communicating to the tribe that this is your plan. This, is, this can be updated or revised whenever you want you just have to tell me what your goals are and um, it can be done. It's not, and that's the point of it too. So um, that's, that was a big point that I was really uh, wanted to stress. So overall it was, it was very positive. Thanks Levi. And I, and I can answer that also for, for Paula. And so there's different ways to a, a, approach this just to get a community reaction. And I, I'll say that if you're just going to, write a, a complex plan or a comprehensive plan, you may end up with a document that's anywhere from, you know, 50 to 500 pages long. And we're going through this right now. We're doing an update to our hazard mitigation plan, which has a lot of this, the climate impacts in it as well. And it, we put it out for public review because that's what FEMA requires. And we've had, um, so far, I think, uh, zero, that would be zero comments because nobody wants to read it. Even the, the 80 page summary document that we provided for the, uh, I think the whole thing is literally like 700 pages long, it's outrageous. And that's just for a 13,500 acre reservation. So you know that there's tribes where it's gonna be a hell of a lot more than that. Um, all of which is to say that the community is not reading our climate adaptation plan or our vulnerability assessment. And that's why we created those one page handouts that's why we're in the process of developing an app for our tribal community, but focused on kids specifically, that can be a kind of a fun way for them to learn about some of the vulnerabilities that we identified um, and to make it more of a little bit of a game uh, than, uh, uh, than a chore uh, to learn about these things. So I think if, if I had to answer honestly, what is their reaction to the findings? I would say, I have no idea because nobody's commenting, uh, but I know based on our outreach materials that the, that people are, are happy that we're doing this. And I, as a piece of advice, I would also say that the way that we've 
that you can develop some of these things if you've got a leadership that maybe is a little bit iffy about whether climate change is a thing. I mean, it's a thing, but don't have the argument. Uh, instead, you've done your vulnerability assessment and you've said, okay, we've identified that we're gonna have some significant impacts from, from drought and heat. So let's just develop some strategies for drought and heat. And you never have to say the words climate change. Uh, so if you could, and we had some community members, we had one in particular, who's a friend of mine and he took our, our survey and, you know, on a scale of, of zero to five, zero being least and five being most, how concerned are you about climate change? And he put zero. I was like, dude, you know, what the heck? How can you put zero? He's like, I don't know, Shasta, I'm just not convinced. I'm like, okay, well, are you hot at your house? Is it getting hot? Oh man, the heat's bad. I'm like, well then, you know, here's some, here's some resources for that. Um, and so I'm like, forget it. I'm just not, I'm not going to argue about this. Uh, all right. We do have a couple of other questions. Uh, Melissa Navis from the Forest Service wants to know, as a result of migration of plants and animals due to climate change, are the number of agencies you work with also growing? Levi. Muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay. You know, and I haven't been with the tribe, I haven't worked for the tribe for too long. I mean, I've been here about for four and a half years, but actually I have seen an increase in the number of uh, agencies that we work with. I mean, that is a result of, you know, applying to as many you know, grants as we can to support our program and, and linking them to climate change as well. But, um, I'm not sure what what that is. I, I think some of it may have to do with I I don't know. I think there is a greater emphasis on these agencies to do a better job at con consultation with tribes, and that's a great thing. And I think it hasn't been done to the uh, best ability in certain points. I mean, I can only describe experiences from this tribe, but. Um, Overall, it's, uh, it, I think it has increased, but as far as it relates to climate change, I, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. always open to, to working with everyone. Well, not to throw anybody uh, working for an agency under the bus, you know, I, I, I won't name names, but uh, I know that from an administration level, especially the, in the federal agencies, um, they're not encouraged to, to reach out on climate change planning. But in private conversations, it's, look, I know this is a problem, we'll find a way. Um, and I even gave a presentation on this at the first Southwest um, Tribal Climate Adaptation Summit on basically how to apply for climate change funding without calling it climate change. <laughs> uh, and, you know, so I think, I think more agencies, uh, staff, they realize this is something they need to work on with tribes because otherwise they end up with gaps in their, their climate planning where the reservations are. And we're trying to remedy that with the, the uh, tribal working group as part of the Climate Science Alliance down here in uh, Southern California. And Levi is a, an active part of that group where we, um, we work together to try to, to fill in some of those gaps. Um, you know, I, I, there's now a bunch of questions are coming in, but actually I have one that's for EPA that I wanna make sure gets, gets answered from Christopher Paulino, he wants to know, for many, it seems the climate change adaptation plan exists as a living document. Are revisions to the plan eligible under EPA funding? And as the national climate assessment and state specific climate assessment can produce the best available climate data, it would seem necessary for re-evaluation and revision every few years. So I can start with uh, the main comment of work with your GAP project officer. And I'm also gonna punt this question to Jeremy. Jeremy? Can you unmute and respond? Oh, Jeremy's even gonna video. Hi, Hi Jeremy. Jeremy. <laughs> hey, Shasta. How are you? Yeah. I think that's a great question. Uh, I would I second what Suzanne says. Uh, talk to your GAP project officer. Uh, it's similar to ETEPs, which if those need updates, we fund that through GAP. So if a plan like this needs an update, um, just work with your GAP project officer and you could probably find a way. Were you online when I said people should just copy and paste their tribe's names into, <laughs> I mean, what, I, what did I, I say? I assume you were being tongue in cheek. Yeah, I was, I was on. Uh, yes, yes. People should take advantage and not re reinvent the wheel. And I'm sure uh, everyone would be 
more thoughtful than just doing a find and replace, but uh, <laughs> yes, certainly re uh, reusing things that have already been created is, is a great use of resources. Yeah, you, everybody who knows me should know by now that my, my tongue has been surgically stapled to the inside of my cheek. <laughs> it's a permanent condition. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, and here's a, a question specifically for you, Levi, about uh, the effect of climate change on the Joshua tree and the current push to get it placed on the California endangered plant list. Has the 29 Palms tribe been able to affect or, or been affected by the Joshua tree? You know, on the tribe's uh, reservation section in the high desert near 29 Palms, there actually is not, is not a single Joshua tree on that piece of land. So as far as um, you know, seeing a decline in Joshua Tree on tribal lands, it, it they never they're not there right now. But um, you know, it's I, it still is a significant concern. And right now, I mean, the tribe is just evaluating the push and still trying to consider. I mean, what what a position a, a good position would be. You know, in the community in the high desert. The, there's a lot as, as far as, you know, you need to choose your battles and you, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act as far as, you know, uh, your, your, your interactions with other, like the community and other interests, but as far as, you know, the Josh tree goes, it's, it, it's absolutely a concern and just something the tribe is watching closely right now. I have a quick follow-up question on that. I, I, I went to a webinar a couple weeks ago about wildfires in the desert, and one of the issues they raised in that webinar was invasive grasses, invasive species that are now growing in the desert between Joshua trees and between cacti, and that the, the wildfires associated with those grasses have become a huge concern. And I, I don't know if that's something you've seen. Um, you know, not... I'm not familiar with any wildfires recently up in uh, at least High Desert and 29 Palms or in the Coachella Valley. Um, there are wildfires uh, in the Coachella Valley, but that aren't related to, you know, uh, anything as far as uh, those grasses go. They're just accidental fires. It could be like a, a burn pit or something like that uh, just gets out of control. But as far as the grasses goes, I, I'm not familiar with that. So, and it's, it hasn't affected anywhere near the, the tribe's own reservation, so. Uh, these are great questions and I, I wish we had, you know, I wish we were all together, honestly, so we could all just go, you know, grab some coffee and, you know, or some lunch and, and really talk about this stuff. But in the minute we have remaining, I, I wanna, first of all, thank both Levi and Suzanne for participating today. I, and actually this was Suzanne's idea to do this panel. So I really appreciate the suggestion. Um, but I also want to make you aware that we did get another year and actually it's a two year grant uh, of funding from the tribal resilience uh, funding from the BIA. So we are in the midst of developing another training program through the Tribal Climate Health Project, but this time we are gonna do some mini on-demand trainings, uh, training videos and make them a little shorter, you know, and have maybe three to five minutes so that you don't have to do like 90 minutes, which can be a lot all, all at once. Uh, and we're gonna have also a live webinar mini series that focuses on the mental health and psychosocial well-being uh, part of this. Uh, and hopefully if things are, we're able to do things in person, we will do a, a vulnerability summit and you know, more presentations like this. So we are gonna keep on keeping on, it's, it's always growing. And I send out all those notices to, uh, to the R Talk. And I also want our agency folks online to know that we do not keep this just to tribes. Anybody who wants to participate can. You know, of course we want as many tribal participants as possible, but with the webinar format, we can have you know, 500 people if we want to. And so we're, we're not gonna tell the agency folks that they can't participate. So. Again, go check out tribalclimatehealth.org and I hope to see you in a future training. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Shasta. Thanks, Levi. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks, John, for your help and Jeremy for kicking in, too.